before, before we started with the approximation, I told you I have no idea. So I have, I have nonlinear equations, and I don't know which frequency will lead to a non, uh, an independent or, in the, or dependent. And I did it intentionally just to tell you or to show you that if you don't understand the physics underlying the problem, you will, you will have uh, only numbers, 1 giga, 2 giga, 10 giga, but, but you, you, you have not any details or any idea about how to pick up this frequency. Therefore, we introduced the uh, approximation, which we call the uh, low contrast approximation or uh, small reflection approximation, in order to uh, go step by step and answer these questions. Which frequencies should we pick up? In my discrete case, I told you, just take omega naught and take a bandwidth uh, maybe to the right of omega naught or because we, we said omega naught, omega naught plus delta plus twice delta and so on. So the entire bandwidth is to the right of omega naught or omega naught is a minimum frequency in the bandwidth. Or you may also have omega naught plus or minus delta omega plus or minus uh, twice delta omega so that the omega naught is a center frequency. And then we showed, and I discussed yesterday only, the impact or the uh, effect of bandwidth. But where is omega naught? So I considered other issues regarding how to choose omega naught. Uh, we talked about the penetration. We talked about yesterday, and this was two, two big, big subjects, uh, whether a bandwidth around omega naught will allow me to penetrate enough into, into the, subject, uh, the object or not. And we considered also the technical aspect of how difficult is it to generate this omega naught and the bandwidth. You see, remember from yesterday. So I tried to, dis to, to consider the problem in such a systematic way, just to say, okay, bandwidth is, uh, is resolution. I may have two gigahertz bandwidth, corresponds to how many millimeters, so you can, you can calculate it very, very quickly because it is uh, uh, C divided by uh, uh, delta X is C di times uh, delta T, because distance is speed times time. And time is roughly proportional to one over bandwidth. So as, as a rule of thumb, you have C divided by bandwidth. Maybe with twice pi or with pi or something like that. But, but as a rule of thumb, you have the X resolution is speed of light divided by bandwidth. OK, and, and the calculation is very, very, very simple. Of course, if you have a slowing down of the speed, C in a material is less than C in free space, right? So C in free space is a, is a maximum speed. So if you, if you would like to be conservative, you say, okay, I will consider C in free space and I will have always, be, because of the, of, of the non-one or non-unity dielectric constant, I have a better resolution inside the, the object. So if you, if you take C naught divided by the bandwidth, you are on the safe side. But this doesn't tell us anything about what, where is omega naught? And then, therefore, we, we picked up omega naught in order to have penetration, and this depends on the, uh, on the, on the subject, on, on the object to be imaged. And another, another factor was uh, how, how easy, how difficult is the generation of a signal at this omega naught and around the bandwidth. So I thought that this answers your question, right? Because we, we considered it yesterday this way. Or it is not yet, yet answered. So omega naught, we will pick it up uh, depending on whether the wave at this omega naught can penetrate or not. Yesterday, we, discuss, we, we, we considered three different or three important issues. Number one, resolution. Number two, penetrability. And number three, the uh, simplicity or the difficulty of generating the wave. 
I would like today to start with what is called, and you may have read it in many, many literature, or if you buy a camera, what is called super resolution. So we, as you saw before, the resolution itself, uh, as being defined yesterday. So how, how can we resolve? Let, us, let, me, let me draw here two points. So So if you, if you have your, I, I call G of T, what we call G of T, this is the infinite resolution image. This is actually the thing which you would like to have. This is the infinite re resolution uh, image. So you have, this is G of T. And now you have, <coughs> you convolve with, if, if I am not windowing, you may also window by a Gauss window, and in this case you will have a, you will not have any side loops, but your main lobe, you will have single main lobe, but the main lobe is, is, much, uh, is wider than any other uh, windowing uh, in which you have side lobes. Okay, so I, let us always take rectangular window in order to have this nice So this is our point spread function, and this is our t, and we convolve the point spread function with with the with the infinite resolution image. Resolution is def or was defined by Lord Riley. This is one of the scientists of the 19th century, as being uh, it was optical definition and, and was, bo uh, was based on uh, graphical observation. Uh, you may still remember the Newton rings in, the, uh, in, in, in your fundamental course on physics. Newton rings are something like that. Newton rings are uh, also the fraction and these Newton rings are something like the sink function. So if you, if you look to the rings, so you have, uh, you have here, uh, let me use this here. You have here very bright and then dark, bright, less bright, dark, and so on. This is, but if you, if you rotate this around the axis, you, you will have neutering. Uh, Lord Riley said, or uh, so postulate, postulated that if I have two point sources, so my G here are two point sources. So this is G, one point source here, and one point source here. If I convolve these two point sources by my point spread function, I will have the point spread function centered around this, right? So if these are my G of T, say at T1 and T2, G hat of T, will look like that. Right? So now he argumented, okay, let us, let us bring the two points in order to define a resolution. It is how far can I bring these two points near to each other and I'm still able to distinguish them in the real image. Of course, if they stay as I impulses, you can bring them as near as you wish, and you have infinite resolution. But because of the spreading, because of the convolution with the point spread function, now uh, you may bring them to a certain extent, and afterwards you see them as if they were single points. And this is actually the old definition of resolution. I will not say old, I will say the traditional definition of resolution. It's called so, it is also called Riley diffraction limitation resolution. Diffraction limitation resolution. And he 
found the rule of thumb. He, he, he thought, okay, when the peak of one sink is coincident with the zero of the other sink, this is my limit. As you see, it is not a sharp limit or sharp definition. But it is something like, like I can distinguish between two point sources when the corresponding point spread function, the peak of these two point spread functions, the peak of one is coincident with the first zero of the other. And of course, the other way around, because they are th symmetrical. You, you have the same point spread function. OK, this is, this is something like that. If, 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 you are, if I, uh, I will enlarge the point spread function, say this is one. And we have a zero here. And let us take the other one. I think it will be, uh, it will be here. So the distance itself is, if this is t, we, we show yesterday it was uh, one, 1 over twice b, I, th I think. Or one, 1 over b, I, I don't, I, one, 1 over b. Huh? Well, twice b, one, yes, okay? So this is, this is the uh, resolution defined by Riley. If you, if you have studied advanced course in communication, this is also very, very common in communication. Because in communication, you, you, you don't deal with, uh, with point spread functions or something like that. But if you send pulses, rectangular pulse in, in frequency domain, so the, the time domain pulses are sync. And you can also you have the Nyquist rate. And the Nyquist rate is 1 over 2 ISB. So it's very, very similar, the resolution issue with the, with the communication issue. OK. Good. So we, we believed or we adopted the uh, Riley definition of resolution for very, very long time. Until uh, the modern computers evolved and uh, we became able to have fast computation algorithms. And this was the reason for, uh, for the evolution or the, uh, the, the appearance of what is called super resolution techniques. Super resolution means I would like to go beyond the Riley limit, which means I, will, I would like to break this rule. And we will see now that this, this uh, breaking of the Riley rule uh, complies with the Shannon information theory. Do you still remember what is Shannon information theory? It says that the, the information capacity, of course it is related to, to, to signal processing and information, but it tells us that the information capacity is a product of bandwidth times 1 plus signal to noise ratio, or log 1, one plus signal to noise ratio. You, you remember that. And so based on Shannon, he tells us, OK, I can buy bandwidth by signal to noise ratio and the other way around. And now try to, to uh, apply this on our situation here. Imagine that you have limited measurement bandwidth, which dictates the resolution this way. And you, th you think now, but Shannon told us that there is exchangeability between signal to noise ratio and bandwidth. So principally, if I believe Shannon, I must be able to go beyond the Riley limit by improving the signal to noise ratio. I think it is logic, huh? or, or not. So based on this very, very simple argument that if we believe in Shannon, so 
we should be able to improve the resolution or go beyond the Riley limits uh, if we improve the signal to noise ratio. Signal to noise ratio as being uh, related to the measurements. And I will show you now, and, and it's really, really, so maybe a theoretical limit. I will show you now that you may have tiny bandwidth and very, very nice signal to noise ratio. In the limit, you have zero bandwidth and you have signal to noise ratio of infinity. And in this case, you can have equivalently, equivalently the infi infinite bandwidth in principle. And this was actually the argument of Shannon in his famous information theory paper of 1949. I, I'm not sure whether you are acquainted with that or you read how, how deep is your information about the information theory. But for those of you who uh, studied this or who were involved in information theory, they understand what I mean. Okay? So the... the idea itself is very simple. It, 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 is, it relies on, instead of observing the merging of the two sync function graphically, so visually, why not to say, OK, I, I have, say, uh, what, what I measure, say, g of t. If I excite, if I know that the g, not g, g hat, if, if I know that G itself is two successive Dirac delta, once by T1 and once by T2, the first one is, say, very, very strong, has a magnitude A, and the second one is a little bit weaker, had magnitude B. So I know that what I measure is, say, A times point spread function, let us call it P. This is here the point spread function of t minus t1 plus b times p of t minus t2. Do you agree? So I will, I will say this is actually what I'm going to measure. And now I think, am I able to find out t1 and t2 by measuring as much as I can? So I will measure and measure and measure. So if I, if I, if I uh, come uh, nearer, and, uh, so I mean the uh, interval of measurements uh, becomes smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. So I can actually have enough number of equations in A, B, T1, and T2. So you have now by, by measuring at say, uh, you can measure at, uh, let, in order to distinguish from between T1 and T2, say measure at T, measure 1, T measure 2, I will give, give it a bar. T measure 3, T measure n. So you can, you can measure as much as you can, hoping that with this uh, overdetermined system of equation, of course, you have here nonlinear equation because the uh, T1 appears as an argument of P. Maybe A and B, the relation between uh, to A and B are linear, because you have A times some, something. But the relation uh, for T1 and T2 is nonlinear, because it is governed by the form of the point spread function. So we, we, we deal here with a um, nonlinear system of equation. OK? So principally, I can, I can solve for T1 and T2, and I don't see now, and I ask you, any, any reason why I can't find T1 and T2 as, as, as near to each other as possible. But what prevents me? If, if uh, Lord Riley tells me, no, you cannot go, you cannot detect T1 and T2 when the distance or when the, uh, the difference between both is less than one over twice bandwidth, and I tell him why. What what prevents me? I will show you now because you 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 will have system of equation, and again in order to to explain things in a in a in a 
uh, explainable or in clear way, let us assume that the relation is linear. Because nonlinear, we have some, some side effects which, which prevents uh, explaining the, the reasons clearly. If you have, uh, if, 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 if the equation for, say, A, B, T1, and T2, uh, if these four, four unknowns are related by, say, four linear equations, uh, what is the uh, main reason for inaccuracy in solving such a system of equations? If you have a system of four equations in four unknowns, it is the conditioning of the matrix. Because, because usually, if you have a linear system of equation, you take the matrix, invert it, and if you invert it, so you can find the solution. Right? Now imagine that T1 and T2 are very near to each other. So we have actually, we look for solution where the T1 and T2 are near to each other. And, and let us assume now that each equation, if, if T1 and T2 are very near to each other, I must expect something like the equations themselves are one is this way and one this way. Uh, sorry for that. Say, this is one equation and this is one equation. So they are nearly linear linearly in, uh, dependent. So that when I invert the matrix, I have problem with the condition number and problem with the accuracy. So as T1 and T2, because if they become near to each other, they are roughly the same. So actually, you are not dealing with four equations in four <coughs> unknowns. You are dealing with four equations in three unknowns. And in this case, you must expect or you must uh, uh, you must expect that uh, the rank is, is 3 and not 4. Nevertheless, if I would be able to measure noiseless, I have infinite signal to noise ratio. I can bring these two lines as near to each other as possible, and I'm still able to find out the solution, which is here. Okay? What prevents me from going, from exaggerating, from going beyond a certain limit? I, I will have a lower limit, lower than Riley, definitely. But theoretically, I can go to zero, but I, there, there will be another limit, which is actually dictated by the noise performance of my measurements, because this line, again, is corrupted by noise. This line is also corrupted by noise. And I will have some area within which I'm not sure how, whether my, my solution is here or there. So this noise ribbon will, is a new limit. It is not the bandwidth, the old limit, but it, it became now the, the, the uh, noise ribbon around my measurements. And now we say, oh. The, the Shannon is much more clever than, than Riley. Because Shannon, Shannon told us that. Shannon told us that you can exchange bandwidth with signal to noise ratio. The core idea is clear. Core idea is there is the resolution I introduced yesterday. It was justified by the saying of Riley and saying of people worked in optics and people worked for at least 200 years until the digital signal processing became popular and became also known to nearly everyone. And with the, with the, uh, with the birth, birth of uh, information theory, we know now that we can exchange bandwidth, we can exchange resolution, we can improve the resolution by improving the signal-to-noise ratio. And this is exactly what you have in your camera. If you have a camera, you read always optical zoom 
and numerical zoom. I don't know, or, or digital zoom. The optical zoom is dictated by Riley. The numerical zoom or the, the digital zoom is actually implementing signal processing techniques to make use of this here. I'm not, I'm not distinguishing between the two point spread functions by my eyes. I write down equations like, like this equation here. Oh. I think it was here. Like, like this equation here, and I try to solve them numerically by, by making measurements. Of course, now you, you can afford that. You have a fast processor in, into your camera, and you can make it for every individual point. OK, now let us see how noise uh, so principally affects the whole process. We, we see here only, only uh, qualitatively that noise is a new limit, or the noise ribbon is a new limit. But, but how can we understand this uh, using another approach? If you, if you now say that G hat is the convolution between G and the point spread function, Okay, this means that if I perform Fourier transform, I know that, that uh, the Fourier transform of G was my uh, reflection coefficient measurements. But I will, I will call it a little bit different now in order just to, to have nice, nice time domain frequency domain correspondence. I will say, okay, in this case, G of omega, which is actually R of omega within, within the, uh, the de dedicated bandwidth is g of omega times p of omega. OK, and we have p of omega. Our p of omega was a rectangular pulse. Therefore, so I will say this is actually r of omega, uh, which we call it this way, r bar, this two. So we have, say, if this is here omega, and the spectrum of the high resolution image is something which extends to wide frequency band, what you did, this is say, g of omega, and our limited bandwidth, say, it was something like that. This is P of omega, the point spread function, or our measurement window. And this is here, zero. So we cut the uh, wider spectrum by such a function. If we really cut by rectangular pulse, we kill all high frequency information. So, and there is no hope to retrieve them back. So the only way is to say, OK, my limited frequency measurements uh, will not kill the, uh, the out-of-band out data, but it will weaken them. It will attenuate them very, very strongly, as if you have really a filter. If, if you have a filter, so in this case, you will not have a rectangular pulse. This is an ideal field. But you have, you have something like that. This is. So now, if you ask yourself, I'm now trying to retrieve uh, information from outside the band. So I have the pass band which is baseband now, I'm trying now to retrieve information from outside the band. So this is called, do you, do you still remember in the, in the uh, communication what is it called? If you try to improve the uh, bandwidth, it's called equalization. 
Equalization is something like if I have a system and this system deteriorates my signal. Like I have, for example, a narrow band band, uh, band pass filter or, or narrow band uh, low pass filter. And, and this deteriorates the quality of my speech. So you have something like equalizer, which actually tries to compensate for the effect of this uh, uh, low pass filter or band pass filter. It's called equalization. In equalization, all what you, what you do is to look for this P of omega and to try to divide by it. So something like, okay, I, I have, oh, it, 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 it seems that it is, it is updating, I don't know why, I think this is, so because it is connected to the internet, so it's downloaded, update, and now, this is stupid. So I will use the, uh, so I, I, I must have, I will use the, uh, the board, yeah. So, if you if you look here, uh, so I have say this is my G of Obinger, and this is my P of Omega, which limited. I multiply both, so I killed actually not not killed, but I attenuated highly attenuated the high frequency information. Okay, now in order to to increase this band with a little bit, let us assume that we we have a equalizer, and this equalizer will will do something like that. So the inverse of this, it is something is one over. So it 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 is high when when p of omega is low. So this is, if this P of omega, I can say this is 1 over P of omega. So equalization means in order to improve the effect of P of omega in, in terms of I would like to retrieve <coughs> high frequency information, which also means <coughs> I increase the bandwidth, but also means I improve the resolution, I should do something like equalization which is done actually by the signal processing, by, by following one of the methods or the method I, I showed you. But effectively, it is equivalent to that. Can you tell me what is the danger of that now? Just, just think about it. So if I equalize this way, what, what, is, what is the danger? Can, can I equalize actually up to infinity? It's a question. Sir, I think in most of the cases, uh, we don't know about the properties out of the band. Probably. No, but we try to retrieve it. No, no, <coughs> we have information of limited band, and we try to extend that information in the vicinity of the band with the help of equalization. Yeah, yeah, because actually your system is band limited. Your system is band limited. Okay? Therefore, what you get in terms of G hat uh, has already highly attenuated the high frequency information in your image. Okay? So it is a hardware problem. Your hardware uh, is band limited and it had the effect of highly attenuating the high frequency components or the high frequency information what is going on now so let me first log in We are here. We are back. So it will. So let me let me yeah. 
yes, yes, exactly, exactly. This is this is a problem because don't forget that. Let me now see whether I am able now. Yes, it it tries again. So don't forget that you also have noise here. And if you multiply by, I didn't wrote it, draw it here, so I, I saw I will multiply by this here, which is <coughs> 1 over p of omega. <coughs> if the signal goes below the background noise, below the noise floor, now you amplify because your equalizer works as an amplifier outside the band because you're, you're, it is 1 over p of omega. Now, <coughs> you amplify the signal and the noise, but if the noise is higher than the signal, so actually you strengthen the noise more than the signal. And what, what should you expect? Noisy image. <coughs> Any one of you, if you, <coughs> if you have this digital zoom, and you try to, to exaggerate, to make digital zoom, what, what do you see on the picture? So at certain limit, you see it is very, very noisy. <coughs> and this is exactly our limit. So our limit is I can equalize, I can compensate, not necessarily hardware-wise, like here, by, by dividing by 1 over p of omega, but I do it uh, uh, as a <coughs> mathematical algorithm. The only problem here is uh, if you exaggerate, if you try to go beyond another limit, which is better than the Riley limit, if you try to go beyond this limit, the noise itself will deteriorate your picture. And this is, again, a justification of the saying of Shannon. Because if you really are able <coughs> to measure noise-free, signal-to-noise ratio is infinity, I can do it without any limit, and I can retrieve the information completely. This is a limiting case. Okay? So, super resolution is, is at least, as, as a very, very simple explanation is understood now, if you hear, if you re read once a paper on super resolution technique, or what, what can you understand under the term super resolution, it's again, the exit, it is based on, it relies, it relies on the exit changeability between bandwidth, which is directly related to resolution, and signal to noise ratio. In other words, I can be content with small bandwidth and compensate this bandwidth by a better signal to noise ratio. What does better signal to noise ratio mean? Because if you have a system, you have the noise, so the signal is dictated by the power which you received, the noise is dictated by the system. If the system itself uh, produces noise, you can use, make use, as, as, you, as you know, in, in a communication chain, the uh, first system after the antenna is high gain, low noise amplified. Okay? And you know why. Because this way you, <coughs> you improve the overall uh, noise figure. And this is actually not related to, the, uh, to, to uh, uh, antennas and communication law. Any system which acquire information and process this information must have the same. So you receive as weak signal, even your camera. Your camera received a weak light, and this light could be amplified, maybe after having been digitized. But, but you have, again, a communication, link, a, a communication chain. And, and what, what applies in the, in the communication theory applies also in the imaging here, applies also in, in, in many other areas. As long as what you measure, what you acquire, is weak. Okay, so a signal to noise ratio is dictated by the system. What can you do? In order to go beyond further beyond the Riley Riley limit. 
You do what is called in the literature denoising. Denoising the data. Denoising the data means the, the most simple example of denoising is averaging out. And you, you, you have done this in, in your uh, experiments. If you, if you uh, in, the, in the past, you went to the lab and uh, the instructions were so, don't measure just once, measure maybe 10 times and average out. OK? So averaging out is one uh, way of denoising. In order to understand the denoising process a little bit more better, imagine, let us take this specific example. You have a signal which is pure monochromatic. Pure monochromatic. But it is very, very weak. Say, has, uh, is, it, is it from, uh, I think it's from telephone or this, this noise here? Uh, if it is monochromatic and very weak, say 10 to the minus 20 volt, so that it is hidden below the noise. You have a noise floor of, say, millivolt or microvolt, or something like that. If you observe, if you have the signal and the noise in the time domain, nobody can claim I can identify the signal, I can separate the signal from the noise. Correct? Because one is like, 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 say, 10, 10 meter water, and the signal itself is maybe on the first, uh, first 10 centimeter on the floor. But let me propose the following. Perform for this sum a Fourier transform. Of course, you cannot perform the Fourier transform as Fourier told you, integrate from minus infinity to infinity. You integrate, you have a time window. So you take the signal and integrate it over a certain time window, and this is your Fourier transform. But you know, your time window will, will, in the frequency domain, will transform the pure monochromatic in a sync function. And this sync function becomes narrower and narrower, and higher and higher, as the time of integration increases. Because the sync function itself, the first zero is inversely proportional. Uh, the first zero is uh, inversely proportional to the time of integration. So actually, you bring the sync function, you, you sandwich it, and you bring it so, and it goes higher and higher. In the limiting case, if you integrate for till infinity, the peak itself becomes infinity. This is a Dirac, right? But for us, this means if you integrate for, if you perform the Fourier transform and integrate for a long time, this peak will be higher and higher and higher. And at a certain limit, it will come above the noise floor. So you need only time, which, which is justified also by what you call averaging. Because if you look, actually, if you look to the Fourier transform, it is averaging. Because look, look to the form of Fourier transform. You say, I take f of t, I integrate it. I don't perform the, the conventional average. I perform what is called weighted average. What is weighted average? You don't weight the, uh, the different parts of the function equally, like, like a rectangular pulse. You You may consider this as a weighting function, OK? And f of omega itself is, you may consider omega as a parameter. So change omega, you change the weighting function. But in all cases, you are building average. And the time of integration here, say, from t naught to t naught plus t, this t here is the averaging window. The wider this window is, the better you can get, get rid of the noise. If you would like to explain it in the frequency domain, you know that a wider bandwidth means, uh, or uh, uh, integration for a long time, it is something like having a bandpass filter. You, you, you come with a bandpass filter, 
because your, your signal in the frequency domain is something like that. This is omega naught, this is omega, and you have, say, this is a noise. This is noise, this is your signal. If you come with a bandpass filter and cut this way, you will get rid of the part of the noise right and left, and the rest of the noise, which you must take it with you, is actually the in-band noise, right? If you have a narrower bandpass filter, the in-band noise itself will be less. But what does narrow band mean? Narrow band means integration for a long time, because the narrow band, it is the Fourier transform of something else. And, and with, the, with the uncertainty principle, so if you narrow the, the filter, narrow the, the bandwidth of the filter, actually this is equivalent to integrating the filter itself. It's very, very lazy. It, is, it, it takes a long time uh, in order to integrate and to average out the noise. So in the end effect, we need to denoise the signal before applying the compensation or before applying the uh, equalization. And how can we denoise? The, the most simple way is to, to average over a long time. If you would like to, uh, to make it a little bit more professional, so you can wait the signal before average. This gives us now the opportunity to talk about About this here. To talk about this type of, of transformation, I told you just now that if you perform a Fourier transform, so you will map the signal. You, you have a mix between signal and noise. In the time domain, they are indistinguishable. And in the process of denoising, what you have done by applying Fourier transform is to take the the, this sum and to map it in such a way that one is mapped on a plateau spread, this is a noise, and the other is mapped very, very narrow. And you come with a filter, something like the cup, put it on your signal, cut the signal, of course you take some, some of the noise, but you get rid of the noise. This is, this is what, what we get in a, in a very simple Fourier transform. Let us try now to generalize the concept itself. Fourier transform is weighted average. And I have this guy here, which is called the transformation kernel. So I, I can look to this Fourier transform here as a mapping from the time domain to the frequency domain which is very, very advantageous and very, very beneficial for monochromatic signals. So for monochromatic signals, it maps the monochromatic signal on a narrow mountain, very, very narrow mountain, and it maps the noise on a plateau. So that you come with a, with a, with a knife, with a, with, a, with a cup, and you cut actually the real information, the information, and you get rid of, of the noise. Correct? Let us generalize the idea itself, because this is a discipline in the science, in, or in the signal processing. In order to, to have a better imagination, imagine that your mapping now is in two dimensions, just, just to give me the opportunity to give some, some live examples. So you have mix between noise and maybe different signals, and you can distinguish these different signals and from noise from each other when you consider them in a domain, time domain or special domain. They are a mix so that you cannot distinguish between them. And now you think about a proper transformation, a proper mapping, which will do the following. This is my dream. To take signal number one, to map it on, on a mountain, on a very, very narrow mountain. 
Okay? Signal number two on another one. Number three on a third one. And the noise, the bad noise, is mapped on a plateau. Just performing this transformation, if it exists, just performing this transformation will enable us to separate the different signals from each other, to denoise them, and separate them from noise. This is a big branch in the signal processing. You may have read about, in the signal processing, about independent component analysis. Do you know? Have you, have you heard about that? It is something like I have a sum of, of different components. I, I would like to separate them. Uh, who asked me yesterday or the day before about how can I uh, find out the poles of a system? And I answered, you can, you, can, you know, I, I, I think I wrote the, the equation here. You can say, okay, the, the transient itself is a superposition of, of uh, damped oscillation. And if I measure uh, enough, I can, I can find an algorithm which, which separates the different damped oscillation. And tell me, it, it, it can tell me which frequencies and which attenuation or damping. This, is, this method, which is called singularity expansion method, also belongs to such a category of how can I have a sum and I, have, I can measure, and how can I separate the sum from each other. One of the application is known now. And the, if, you, if you have heard something about the wavelet transform, who, who treated or dealt with wavelet transform? So you know the, the wavelet transform? The wavelet transform is a two-dimensional mapping. And then this two-dimensional mapping, actually, you can tailor this kernel. You can tailor it. But it is not a fixed kernel like that of the Fourier transform, which is e to the j multiplication of the two domains, omega t or kx. The kernel of a wavelet transform you can tailor it. You can make it, adjust it for, for special purposes. And one of the special purposes is here. <coughs> so I will tailor now the kernel of the transformation in such a way that for specific forms of signals, I can map them and I can map the noise in such a way that I can separate them by filters. In this, in this case, a filter is, as I told you, you get a cup and you put it over the signal, cut it, and throw away the rest, which is usually noise. The other way around is also perfect. Uh, it's also okay if, if the noise are mapped narrow and the signal has a plateau. It is more or less a C, because you can, can get rid of these this spikes, uh, and the rest is your signal. But this is, this is a general description of how can I denoise. Why I tell you that? Because in order to go beyond the classical or traditional definition of resolution, which is something like one over bandwidth, you can go beyond by compensation, by equalizing. Equalizing, we do it nowadays as an algorithm, as, as a signal processing algorithm, not necessarily by 1 over p of omega, but by algorithm, OK? But we saw the danger of equalizing. The danger is in these parts of the spectrum where the noise is over, is stronger than the signal, because I, I would like now to retrieve signal, which is very, very weak. It, it's, it's hidden now uh, below the, uh, the noise. So in, in these areas, uh, when I amplify, I'm, I amplify both, and my, my uh, output is very, very noisy. Therefore, before doing that, I must first denoise. I think we consider now, in addition to the, uh, to the uh, features, resolution, penetrability, uh, difficulty of generating signals, we also uh, considered in this short time uh, the possibility of going beyond the Riley resolution uh, using signal processing, applying Shannon information theory, 
Uh, and we saw that we can do it also to a new limit. There is a limit, but the limit is better than that of Riley, than that of the one over the bandwidth. And in order to, to improve this limit, we should denoise. Of course, don't forget that all these things, they need time. So in order to, uh, to make the signal processing, the signal processing itself, everything looks now nice. So I, I tell you very, very nice stories. But if you, if you do it online, you must now uh, compromise. How much time do I have for denoising? Can, can I wait if you, if, you, if you have, say, a movie? And a movie, so in order to, you must be done. You must be done before the next frame comes. Because if the number of frames is less than, in, in a minute or in, in a second, is less than 50, so you, you, you feel that it is, it is not a movie, not, not a continuous movie. So there are other factors which affect, which affect the process, which put the real limitations. This is one factor is if you work online, you must uh, do the task, you must finalize the task in a finite time, in a certain time. And this dictates actually the new limit. This is one thing. The other thing is how much power do, we, do you insert in the signal processing? This, is, this was also uh, not, not an issue at all till 10, 10 years ago. People were so proud of and so uh, fascinated from digital signal processing. Let us forget the analog world completely, okay? Until they recognized that the Digital signal processing, you have a processor and this processor becomes very, very hot. It is a fast, fast processor. And you know now in a desktop you have a, you have a, uh, so, uh, a cooler and, 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 and the, the energy invested in the digital signal processing must be compared now, and this is really a very, very important issue in the communication. People, so exaggerate and say we can have now, we improve the bit error rate of a technique by very, very intensive and complex digital signal processing, okay? But you can ask yourself, and instead of putting the power into the digital signal processing, why not to put it in the transmitted signal? And I can have, I, I raise the signal to noise ratio, uh, so that the uh, power needed for the digital signal processing is used elsewhere, not necessarily for the digital signal processing. Therefore, people now try to, when they compare, they say, look to the improvement in the bit error rate and calculate the needed, they call it complexity, okay? Complexity is related to the power consumption in the processor. Okay, so, and now they compare it with the other simpler case in which you take the power, put it, or improve with it the signal to noise ratio, and you will improve directly the bit error rate if you improve the signal to noise ratio. Okay, so this is just for your thoughts that uh, every, every technique and every, every thought has its limitation. Don't exaggerate. Look for other alternatives. Okay. So, let me touch now. I think, uh, do you have first question? I, I think I, I said enough about the one-dimensional imaging. It was actually in terms of the fundamental quantities like resolution, like point spread function, like all these things, it was not related only to one dimension. But the one dimension is very simple and very nice. <coughs> Uh, to, uh, to explain so that you can use it just for, for the definitions for explaining and bringing things to your, to your mind in a, in a clear form. If you have any, any quick question which I can answer before touching the two dimension because actually I recognize now that we need maybe another week in order to cover the two-dimensional and three-dimensional. In the second 
uh, slot. Uh, uh, till, till when should we, uh, so, so the, first, the first lecture and the first slot uh, till, we, we have now an hour, so another half an hour or another what? Yes, yes, the second one, when should it start? Okay, okay, because I have another presentation, this is the second slot, uh, on GPR and SAR, uh, Synthetic Aperture Radar, uh, and this is actually not, uh, I, I will not use the uh, Surface Book, here I will use a PowerPoint, it is actually also not PowerPoint, it is a PDF, but it is clear enough. Okay. Let us, let us now touch the two-dimensional imaging. In the one-dimensional imaging, we were concerned of uh, penetrating into, into the object to be imaged, bringing information from inside. Therefore, we, uh, the bandwidth played a role for the resolution. Therefore, the operating frequency played a role in, uh, for the uh, penetrability and so on. The two-dimensional imaging <coughs> is now, I have a surface, I'm, I'm not intending or I don't intend to penetrate. It is like photography. <coughs> All what I'm going to do is this surface will be, yes, thanks. This surface will be illuminated like flash of a camera. Upon, upon being illuminated, it reflects back works as a secondary source. The primary source is your flashlight, and the secondary source, so, yes, the secondary source is, is what you reflect, what your face or what your body reflects, this second source. And now we ask ourselves, can we capture this reflection and reconstruct your image based on that? This is the question which we are going to answer. I don't need to go inside the body. And it is just a surface imaging. The idea of surface imaging is very, very clear. Because you can, you can actually imagine that this room here is dark. And you have a torch. And you would like to see the walls. So all what you do is to take the torch and you would like to, to see the details, point for point. So you take the torch and light the different points. You go line by line until you cover the whole area. And this is actually the two-dimensional imaging. The only problem in the two-dimensional imaging is if I have a torch, if I have very, very thin pencil beam for lighting, I have no problem because I can go and go point for point, okay, until I cover the whole area, mechanically or electronically, doesn't matter, but I can have the details point by point. So again, you have something similar to moving average. The spot itself, the point spread function, the spot itself works like this P of T, but now we have P of X and Y. Maybe something like the Gauss, or maybe something like uh, the sink rotated. If you rotate the sink, you will have, you will have the main lobe, and the first is a ring, the second is another ring, and, and so on. Okay, you can you can extend now your imagination of the sink function or of a point spread function from the one dimension to the two dimensions. But more or less, you can build what is called moving average. The weighting of this moving average is a point spread function. You lose details <coughs> if, if the width, if the extension of the point spread function becomes larger. Okay? You have higher resolution if the uh, extension of the point spread function becomes narrower. Okay? Would you agree with that? Let us see now what, what dictates I, I gave the, uh, the uh, example now with the torchlight. If you have, if you illuminate with another frequency, say millimeter wave or 
or microwave or terahertz signal, the, you, you need an antenna array in order to have this pencil beam. This torch light now is, is your, your pencil beam coming from the array. And we'll see now what the, the frequency itself or the bandwidth itself doesn't play any role. I need bandwidth only if I would like to penetrate, if I would like to go inside the object and extract information from there. If I'm going to build or to reconstruct a two-dimensional surface image, I don't need any penetration. I don't need any bandwidth. I can work monochromatically. And this also explains why you have, you can have very, very nice photos, your classical photo, your optical photo, using just one color. You can illuminate by yellow, you can illuminate by green, by blue. It is a one tone or one frequency. And if you illuminate and ca capture the results at this frequency, you have a very nice, nice uh, image. Okay? Of course, maybe you say, oh, it is all green. You will have the different degrees of green or the different degrees of blue. If it is monochromatic, you use the bandwidth here just to be, to be nice. The, the picture itself it is subjective. It is not objective. So just to see contrast between red and blue and so on. So the bandwidth here is not necessary for, for resolution. It's not necessary for... Uh, for penetration is not necessary at all. It is only <coughs> to have a nice picture. But if, if this subjective nice is not needed, you can work at a purely monochromatic signal. So we can work uh, with a monochromatic illumination, okay? And we will have our two-dimensional signal. Let us now touch the problem of how an antenna array working at the same frequency, we will not have a bandwidth, how an antenna array influence this spot. The spot itself works exactly like the point spread function. Of course, in the, in the original, if, if we would have had enough time, I intended to go with the revision step by step. But, but now I'm explaining, the, say, the final results which are actually, which come actually after driving, explaining, discussing with you, and then we see a nice equation and then we try to explain it. I am giving now to you in this short uh, coverage only the final results. If you have an antenna array, a one-dimensional antenna array, it is So let us say I order my antennas, whether they are receiving or transmitting antenna along a line. Okay, this distance D, and I have here n equals zero to n minus one. I have n element array. Okay, the length of the array itself, which corresponds, we will see now, corresponds to the bandwidth and the penetration imaging is n minus 1 times d, or something like n times d. OK, you know that the far field of such antenna pattern is given by far field to something like sine n epsi over 2 over sine epsi over 2, where if you are involved in, in antenna theory, you know what I'm talking about. Epsi itself is given by alpha plus k naught d cosine theta, and my theta is actually the angle measured from the antenna array. So I'm refreshing your information about antenna arrays. Who, who of you have, has never heard anything about antenna or antenna array? By 
Any one of you? So actually, I, I may assume that you heard about the antenna array before. OK, if you look to this one here, Ipsi itself is, is, is an angle, but it is related to the physical angle theta uh, through this relation here. OK, so if I, I look to the pattern of the antenna array, this is here the z-axis. So it is something like that. I have a major lobe, minor lobes, another minor lobes, and so on. So I have a main direction where the main lobe, uh, other, uh, so two side lobes, three side lobes, and uh, uh, so I mean two with the same size, uh, two with a lower size. This function here looks, looks very, very similar to the sink function, but it is a periodic function. Okay, this one here, it is a periodic function, okay, and the array itself will produce an, an radiation pattern uh, which looks like that. I can steer the main beam using this phase, phase angle alpha, okay? Important is the resolution itself, and I would like here to touch two uh, concepts. First one is a resolution, which is, you would agree with me if I say, okay, how, how small or how narrow or how wide the main beam is. Again, if you take this light and you try now to build moving average, the light itself is, you have a main light and two side lights and another two a little bit weaker and so on. This, these are the lights, and, and now you average out, so a point source, if you, if you now work as a receiver, will repeat itself, because, because you come now with a small side loop, you, 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 you have a weak sun, another stronger, until you have the, the, the strongest one, and then you come again down. And this is the artifact we talked about before. So as you see, actually, we don't have big difference between the one-dimensional and the two-dimensional. So actually, you have uh, exactly the same performance. You must properly interpret the quantities. Here, the uh, distance between the antennas itself, if you, if you choose big distances, you can increase the resolution. But at the same time, you will, you will have, due to the periodicity of the pattern, you will have what is called grating lobes. The grating lobes, instead of having just one single main lobe, you will have multiple main lobes. And this is, of course, if you collect information from far away, you collect, instead of assigning the information you receive by your array to this point, now you you average out between this point and this point. So actually, you average out the picture, as if you take, you, you divide the picture twice, and you take this one and put it on the, on the other one. At the same time, if you decrease, so this is called aliasing. It's also known from the communication theory, or grating slope. If you now make the distance between the elements smaller, OK? you sacrifice a resolution. So for, for, for smaller, so you will get rid of the grating loops or the aliasing. But at the same time, the smaller the distance between the antennas, the worse the resolution. So in order to have a compromise which, which, is exactly cor which exactly corresponds to having just one period of this periodic function in the, in the visible range, you take d is equal lambda by 2. Lambda has a meaning now because I'm working monochromatic, and lambda is a wavelength corresponding to the operating frequency. You may generalize this also for two-dimensional array. OK? And in this case, you, you have, instead of, of just one lobe in, in theta, you have the lobe itself will be interpreted in theta and phi. If the correspondence between the one dimension and the two dimensions is confusing for you, please tell me now. I can, I can explain it in another way. But it is a generalization of what we, we explained in details for 
one dimensional, but one dimensional, don't forget, the, you need bandwidth in order to penetrate. The two dimensions, which is a surface image, you need just an antenna. And the, the bigger the antenna aperture, in this case, the extension of the array, the better is the re resolution. Because the bigger the antenna aperture, the narrower the mean loop. And if you have an hour mean loop, you can detect because you convolve the infinite resolution image, now it is two dimensional, with the antenna pattern. So the antenna pattern is, in fact, your point spread function. If we take, take this analogy. So in this case, you can interpret artifacts, because if your antenna pattern is not wind width, I will have something like sine epsi n epsi over 2 divided by uh, epsi over 2. Uh, this is, uh, by the way, I, this is capital N. The number of elements. Sine n epsi over 2 divided by sine epsi over 2. It, it, it is very, very similar to the sync function. Sometimes it's also called the digital sync because it, it, it results from the discretization. Uh, artifacts will, uh, will appear if you have a single, single uh, point source. You will see it now in the two dimensions as not now, not like the one dimensions when you have s a sun and, and two suns right and left and, or, or, or uh, another two weaker and so on. Now, if you look now to the two dimensional sink, you'll see the, the uh, bell, the main lobe, and beside the main lobe, you have these uh, side lobes. They are distributed periodically. So you have some hills, some small hills. So you see a single sun now in the two dimensions as a very bright one, okay, surrounded by some satellites, surrounded by other satellites, and so on. This is the artifact. And now also you can understand the impact of windowing. Because if we window now by by uh, attenuating this, the peripheral of the array. Uh, so you will have a bigger sun. So the spreading is, is higher. But I will benefit now of lower uh, side lobes. OK? So I believe that this coverage is enough uh, for this short course, because we have just five days. We had just five days. Uh, before uh, ending this lecture here, if you have any question, which I can answer now, because the next presentation will be uh, uh, very, very practical. So I will uh, tell you about uh, our research in GPR and SAR uh, uh, in the University of Magdeburg, or at the University of Magdeburg uh, in the late, la late, late, uh, last, uh, say, 15 to 20 years. Any questions? Should we have our stop now or our rest now? So, okay. So we meet in uh, after, 15 minutes, we have a after, after okay, fifteen minutes. So, so we meet eleven o'clock.